and pony bell shimmers morning and pony bell shines and i know for absolute certain that everything <laughs> Salutations, my viewers and subscribers. I am Torrent Pasta 999, your online horror host, where you find out what shall live and what gets sent straight to hell. Nightmare Night is here again, my viewers. And for this year's annual look into terror, what have I decided to do? You might wonder. Well, you would be if the video title didn't give it away. Yes, this year I will review the most child-friendly film to have ever been made, Disney's own forgotten gem, The Brave Little Toaster. Yes, 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 I know I said last year that I would save a review of this movie for Christmas, but come on! I literally only manifest one day a year and there's only so much a vampiric second personality can do in a single day. Besides, do you have any idea how freaking hard it is to record, edit, and both a video all in the same day? Ah, whatever. Onto the singing dancing toasters. Many regard this film as dark, depressing, and downright scary at times, thus making it more obscure. It is not a film people really want to talk about as much as, say, any of the Disney Princess movies. Jeez, and they say I have a problem. People, I will tell you now that the darkness, dreariness, and scariness is what makes this film such a masterpiece! Oh, you think I am saying this just because I am a sadistic second personality that manifests itself in the form of a psychotic vampire bat pony who loves to hear the tortured screams of innocent children? Well then, I am very flattered. But all jest and government aside, this film is layered with far more depth and meaning than you could ever have possibly imagined. We begin this discussion with the film's opening, almost always the most crucial part of any film's presentation, as it sets the tone and themes for the film later on, at least if done right. And this film's opening is no exception. It opens with a bleak, misty morning. The sun has barely risen, and the fog covers almost everything in sight. The music is far from pleasant, setting an even more ominous tone as one might think that they were watching some kind of animated ghost story. Perhaps a reboot of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Then slowly, we come across a lone cottage, and gradually we see inside, seeing that it is abandoned, save for some furniture and appliances. All the while, the opening credits fade in and out. And then the radio is turned on by its alarm and suddenly we have a scene where a talking desk lamp is bickering with a sentient radio. This opening scene perfectly set the tone throughout the rest of the movie by showing us that although the world around them is dark, bleak, and mostly unknown, these mostly comedic and absurd characters go about their business as if this is nothing more than some odd sitcom that Walt Disney conceived during a fever dream. Tonal inconsistency, you might say, as one minute we are focusing on a bleak and empty setting, then on a sitcom about home appliances, and then on an air conditioner going crazy from cabin fever, neglect, and then dying of the air conditioner equivalent of a heart attack. You know you humans have it lucky. When you have a heart attack, you just kill over and die. When air conditioners have a heart attack, they explode. The appliances then realize that they too might be bound for the same fate, doomed to malfunction and die of abandonment. So they set off on a journey to find their old master and restore purpose in their lives. The film is littered with dark and disparaging scene after dark and disparaging scene. A flower dying of depression after facing rejection. The infamous clown nightmare scene. My favorite scene in the film, by the way. The blanket becoming lost in a windstorm and the desk lamp becoming blasted with lightning attempting to find him. The appliances becoming lost to a waterfall with only the vacuum left to watch in horror as they vanish. Our heroes sinking into quicksand with no escape, then finding themselves in an appliance chop shop where a man without care dismembers innocent appliances and sells their parts. Set appliances driven mad by their inevitable fate, singing a chilling but spectacular 
obscure or musical number about the despair of their situation, finding themselves tossed out of their master's home because they're not new enough and find finding themselves in a junkyard, hearing yet another song, now from abandoned cars who despair over their worthlessness and miserably await their crushing deaths while a giant magnet looms over them, determined to drag and drop them to their crushing deaths as well. Becoming trapped with their master on a conveyor belt as the mighty crusher is soon to come down on all of them, and finally, the toaster, left with no other choice but to hurl himself into the inner workings of the great and terrible machine in order to save his friends and master. You'll never see any of that in a Disney princess film! Let us discuss the meaning and depth of the much darker elements. After all, this is our annual Nightmare Night video. Starting with the air conditioner, a character who is never named, he suffers deep-seated feelings of abandonment and uselessness as the master, as a young boy, could never reach his controls to use him. Nor for that matter, could he move anywhere due to the nature of his being. He was forever doomed to spend an eternity stuck in the wall. Whereas at least the other appliances could move around freely, as well as be used by the master. He was never truly mean or cruel, only bitter and miserable due to the circumstances, possibly driven to hate his very existence more even than everyone else's. Until finally, when letting loose his full rage, having been building up for over 15 years, his body cannot take this sudden surge, and he explodes, regrettably ending his miserable existence. We later see the idea of the dangers of abandonment reinforced when Toaster rejects the advances of a flower, love struck by its own reflection on Toaster's chrome, and the flower sinks into such a deep depression that it appears to die. It is also a very strange adaptation of the Greek myth of Narcissus, and the flower is literally a Narcissus, so there you go. This fear of abandonment becomes even more real as Toaster has a nightmare in which the master is taken from him and he is tormented by a giant clown with a fire hose, a tidal wave shaped like forks, and finally Toaster hanging precariously over a bathtub. Not really sure why this would be a nightmare otherwise. For me, it's a sexual fantasy. Oh, get over it! It's not like you don't have disturbing fantasies! These scenes serve to establish that although the Toaster is supposed to be the group leader and thus the most level-headed, we can see just how deeply he fears abandonment and, in his mind, it only leads to a horrible death. And as another internet critic pointed out, some guy in a white wig with a weird voice, the Toaster realizes that he cannot help everyone, especially those deeply under a delusion. Perhaps this even sows the seeds of doubt in Toaster that he cannot convey to the others in fear of crushing them as he did the flower. What if they are under a delusion as well? A delusion that they will find purpose in the meaningful existence again. A delusion that they will avoid being thrown out with the trash and abandoned. Not a fear that is overblown, mind you, for a horribly haunting death approaches them at every turn. Just when they think they've survived the waterfall, they sink into a swamp and appear to drown. Just as it appears that by some miracle they have been saved by a sympathetic soul, the man turns out to be a mutilator of machines who takes apart appliances and sells their parts to unsuspecting customers. For humans, this would seem no big deal, but for machines, it is a sickening, horrifying sight. So horrifying that it's driven most of them insane! The part shop is like an insane asylum, but instead of being held for insanity, the inmates are being held only for the parts of them to be harvested! They evade death once again thanks to a well-done act to scare the store owner as the appliances smash their way to freedom. But of course, the fear of them being thrown away and abandoned is ever-present. Because that is exactly what happens to them when they get to the master's apartment! Unaware that he is back at the cabin looking for them, our heroes encounter a whole new, modern line of appliances, who also seek the master's attention. They tell our heroes that they are outdated and no longer useful before chucking them out the fourth story window into the dumpster below. Ha! Well, the joke's on you because you know machines are now the ones who are horribly outdated! <laughs> Not the point, not the point. Finally, our heroes find themselves where they feared they'd end up. A junkyard, where all the unwanted machinery goes to die. But the worst still, not only are they surrounded by cars who morbidly sing of their worthlessness and inevitable demise, of lives they've witnessed and things they'd seen that had faded into obscurity and regret, albeit to a catchy tune. They are pursued by a relentless junkyard magnet, who is determined to collect them and dump them into the conveyor belt of doom. 
I interpret the dumpster magnet as not a villain because although he is entirely unsympathetic to the plight of our heroes and keeps trying to get them crushed, he is only performing his function as he was built to do. No, rather I interpret him as the Grim Reaper, a silent and terrifying omen of death itself, whom all must meet when their time comes due. The Grim Reaper is also not a villain, rather a necessary force who ensures that all get their due in the end. This adds to the despair in the junkyards as our heroes must now face the inevitability of death, of which they are now at the doorstep of. But ho, oh, what is this? By some miracle, their master shows up at the junkyard and actually rescues them from the conveyor belt. Oh, but that matters nothing to the Grim Reaper. Could it all be a coincidence that this green filter turns hellish red right when it seems they are about to be destroyed in appliance hell? Food for thought. The Doster is the only one who managed to evade the belt, but now is forced to witness not only as his friends, but also his beloved master are sent closer and closer to a horrible demise, to be crushed to oblivion by the giant teeth of the final gate of appliance hell. There is only one way to prevent this, to save all of their lives. The Doster must throw himself into the inner workings of the crusher and jam the mechanism. But in the process, he instead will be crushed to death. He cannot do it! How could anyone do it? To thrust oneself into the grinding gears of death is far too much for anyone to be asked. It is a sacrifice too great to be made! Well, I guess not then. In an ending almost too happy, the Hell and the Grim Reaper left behind them, the Master completely fixes the Toaster, and Toaster is able to join his friends in the care of their Master at long last. Now let us discuss the tonal inconsistency. One minute the film starts out as bleak and kind of scary, the next it's a silly sitcom, and the next we have a character suffering a mental breakdown and literally exploding. Ah, the 80s. Such a violent time. Yet notice something about this sequence of events, that it only becomes a sitcom once the appliances have center stage? And there we begin to find the true depth and meaning of this movie. All throughout the appliances brave godless dangers to reach their goal, met with horrors and despair at every turn, yet they themselves do not change, at least not completely. Notice also how the only song the main characters sing is a bright, cheerful, and hopeful song. Juxtapose that with the songs of the other machines. A song of madness sung by appliances soon to be disemboweled. A song meant to put down the other appliances and build up the newer ones. And finally, a song of the pointlessness of life and existence and the morbid acceptance of death and destruction. The parts shop appliances, though they are driven mad with fear by the fate of being taken apart, never themselves think to escape until our heroes show up. The newer appliances are so afraid of rejection themselves that they will throw the more nostalgic appliances into the garbage just to be taken. And the cars, worst of all, have resigned themselves to their fate and sing the death knells of how worthless they are. All of these groups have something in common notably lacking in our heroes. Though all the machines fear death, only our heroes do not let such fate dictate how they behave. Even when resigning themselves to the fact that their master no longer needs or wants them, they refuse to accept the Magnet Reaper, whereas everyone else would likely either let the Magnet take them or throw themselves at it. But all throughout the film, our heroes Heroes brave every life-threatening danger, though the world seems to try its hardest to break them, and everyone is out to get them at every turn. Yet our heroes will not falter. And I think that that may be the strongest theme and message that one can ever deliver in a children's film. That although the world is undoubtedly a dark and dangerous, cruel place, one that is out to get you, one which the inhabitants will not hesitate to dispose of you in order to ensure their own survival, one cannot relinquish themselves to the darkness and despair. One must hold on to hope even when there is no longer a reason to. It can never be certain as to whether or not your efforts will pay off, but regardless, one still cannot and should not quit. You recall how I said the flower scene plants the seeds of doubt in Tolster's mind about how maybe he and his friends could be delusional in their hopes of returning to their master. 
Yet after they have been named obsolete by the newer appliances and tossed into the garbage, soon after taken to the dump where they are terrorized by a grim reaper junkyard magnet, and the fate of being crushed to death is unavoidable, Toaster does not give in, relinquishing his own life to a horrible demise only because it is the only way to see that his friends and master have a chance at a better future. Not once does Toaster fall to fate. Even when he dies in the gears, it is because he chose to do so for a much greater need than himself. The message in this context could not be any clearer. That you should never give up hope, should never give up on your friends, or the chance that things could be better, even if it means sacrificing yourself for others. Then at least they have a chance. He refuses to surrender to the idea that he and his friends were delusional, fighting to the bitter end for a better ending. And who knows? Maybe that's something we can all take away from this movie. That no matter how much danger and dread we face, that no matter how much the whole world is out to get us, if we hold true to the light within ourselves and never falter to the darkness, we can find ourselves, one day, in a better life. Who knows? A toaster did it. And that was The Brave Little Toaster, my viewers. A film that uses its very silly nature to challenge the most horrifying aspects and themes of our world. Yesterday, today, and most certainly tomorrow. Unpleasant nightmares, every pony. And remember this. Treat your toaster well. Or else when you end up in a car crusher, he will not be there to save you. Happy Nightmare Night! <laughs>